Thank you, Dr. Chen and the ICU Organizing Committee for the opportunity to present here. My name is Azad Mashari. I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist at Toronto General Hospital, and I'll be presenting to you today on TD assessment of the aorta and pulmonary artery. All the materials here are under a Creative Commons attribution license and available at the link here. Uh, these are my disclosures, nothing specific to this presentation. Most of my work is funded by the UHN Foundation and our UHN SHS Anesthesia Association. So I'll start by talking about the value of imaging of the aorta and pulmonary artery and routine preoperative exams. We'll look at the 3D anatomy of the aorta and PA and their relationship to the esophagus and the airway, which determine our TE windows. And we'll visualize the common T imaging views. And we'll look at some pathology, specifically atherosclerosis and aortic dissections. So why bother? Well, uh, imaging of the aorta is quite easy. It only involves a few views that are quite easy to conceptualize. It's very fast. It can be done in under a minute. It is cheap. There's no radiation or contrast. It gives you very high quality images in most cases that are every bit as sensitive or specific, if not more, than CT and MRI. The main limitation of that being the blind spots, which we'll discuss. There's significant diagnostic value in emergencies. You know, diagnosis of an aortic dissection can be life-saving. And of course, there's significant prognostic value in evaluation of atherosclerosis in the descending aorta. Uh, this is some fairly old, but uh, classic data uh, looking at a preoperative stroke after a cabbage and uh, classified by atheroma grade in the descending aorta. And patients who had grade five atheroma had a nearly 50% risk of stroke at one week. Those that had grade four had a nearly 10% and then a substantial drop off uh, below that. And this is a grading system that was used in that study and it's a classic grading system that we still use. The grade one is normal, which is nearly impossible to find in adults. Most adults have at least some degree of enthymal thickening that would make them a grade two. So that it requires a smooth uh, enthymal outline with thickness under three millimeters. Any protruding plaques under five millimeters will make you a grade three. Uh, anything over five millimeters will be a grade four and any mobile segments would make it a grade five, the highest risk category. Atheroma grade in the descending aorta is prognostically useful because atherosclerosis is a systemic disease, and significant atheromas in the descending aorta are highly correlated with atheromatous disease in the cerebrovascular system and the coronary artery system and elsewhere in your arterial tree. And obviously we have significant means for potentially mitigating uh, these risks in patients if they're adequately worked up. So how do we do this? So first we'll just have a quick look at the TE windows. This is a posterior view uh, of a 3D model based on a CT. Uh, so at the very far back, we see the descending aorta coming down. Uh, here in pink, we have the esophagus where our TE probe will be sitting, coming down to the stomach. In front of that, we have the tracheobronchial tree, which is the source of our blind spots. And beyond that, the vessels of the heart. So you can see that in dark blue, the pulmonary artery. In the yellow, we have the heart base and in the transparent red and blue, the right and left, sorry, the left and right uh, blood volumes. The left main stem bronchus uh, marks a division between the upper esophageal window and the mid esophageal window. The mid esophageal window essentially images the heart through the left atrium and is continuous with the lower esophageal window further down. Now these are the three main windows that are used in assessing the aorta. The transgastric window is not particularly involved in this assessment. And these are the blind spots. So one uh, blind spot is caused by the main stem bronchi and the carina, and it severely limits our ability to image both the distal ascending aorta further down and the branch PAs. We're actually able to image the right PA to some extent, but we're very limited at imaging the left PA. In this diagram, it looks like the left PA, which should actually be fairly visible, but in many patients, actually, that left mesa bronchus is higher up, 
and a significant amount of lymphatic tissue. That does not allow ultrasound penetration very well. Uh, in the upper esophagus, we have a blind spot caused by the trachea, which significantly limits our ability to image the distal arch, sorry, the proximal arch and distal ascending aorta in most patients. Just a quick look at the anatomy of the aorta and the PA, of course, are fairly simple structures. This is a posterior view in the middle, anterior view on the left, and a left lateral view on the right. We'll focus on the posterior view since that's the view of the TE probe. So the aortic valve immediately initially comes out of the, sorry, the aorta initially comes out of the aortic valve, uh, heads off towards the right shoulder, then turns midline, curves around the airway and the esophagus, and descends. Uh, the pulmonary artery heads out of the pulmonary valve and goes almost uh, slightly up and straight back and bifurcates with the left pulmonary artery being typically significantly superior to the right pulmonary artery. And here's the same image now with the esophagus and the trachea again interposed. And just to highlight the orientations of the two valves again and the corresponding arteries, the long axis of the aortic valve goes from the right humeral head to the apex, whereas the long axis of the pulmonic valve is along the mid-sagittal plane and goes from the xiphoid to the lower C-spine. So here are the basic TE views for assessing the aorta and the PA. Uh, there are in sort of four sets of long and sh short axis pairs. So we have the midesophageal long and short axis views of the aortic valve. We have the midesophageal ascending aorta long axis and short axis, uh, which also show us the PA in long and short axis as well. We have the upper esophageal arch views and the views of the descending aorta all the way from the upper esophagus uh, down to the lower esophagus. Now, while we have eight views here, you can actually get most of the information with just four of them by basically keeping your probe at or near zero degrees and going through the entire aorta. So for a screening exam, this can be done in under a minute quite easily. Image optimization for aortic imaging, especially for the descending aorta, involves minimizing the depth. I would recommend keeping two or three centimeters beyond the aorta because in many cases you may see a pleural effusion or lung consolidation that may provide useful information perioperatively. You can typically use the higher frequency that your probe is capable of because the aorta and the esophagus are very close to each other. So ultrasound penetration is usually not a limiting factor. And I would recommend using harmonics to minimize satellite artifacts, which are especially significant when you have stronger factors like the aortic wall or calcified plaques. So we'll start imaging at the aortic valve and work our way up. So this is the aortic valve short axis at somewhere between 25 and 45 degrees. Of course, all these angles are very approximate. You can see in our example here, it's actually at 61 degrees. So here we see the aortic valve in short axis, the pulmonic valve in long axis. This is a good view for imaging the coronary arteries at the left main being much easier to see than the RCA, but I'll show you some examples. You can also see the left atrium, the right atrium, the interatrial septum, the tricuspid valve, and the pulmonic valve. And here is a normal example. So again, we see the aortic valve in short axis, the pulmonary valve in something close to long axis. And this example of a severely stenotic aortic valve, you can see the valve is functionally bicuspid. So even though we see a commissure, that commissure is not opening between the left and non-coronary cusps. We have very thickened leaflet edges with very limited opening. And here we're showing the imaging of the RCA, which can be fairly challenging and can definitely becomes a lot easier with the use of color Doppler. This of course would be the right coronary cusp here. And here's the left main coronary artery coming off the left coronary cusp. And you can often even see the bifurcation into the LAD and circumflex quite easily. So next we have the aortic valve long axis view. 
which is obtained from the long axis cut plane. And here you see the aortic root and the proximal ascending aorta. Uh, you see the STJ, and it's a good view to assess for aneurysms, dissections, functioning of the aortic valve, and aortic insufficiency. So here's a normal example. By pulling the probe up a little bit, we obtain the metasophageal ascending aorta views. So in the short axis view shown here, you can see the main pulmonary artery and the RPA. And sometimes you're also able to visualize part of the LPA by rotating a little bit left. We have the proximal ascending aorta, and next to it would be the SVC. So this is a fairly normal example of this view. So we have the ascending aorta here. You can see this, we see a little bit here. We have the main PA and the right PA. So here again, you would see large aneurysms, dissections, and potentially if you have any very, very large thrombi in the pulmonary artery, you may be able to see them here. And this is the long axis view of the ascending aorta from the metasophagus. So here, we now see the right pulmonary artery in short axis and the ascending aorta in long axis. And this is a good view for detecting atheromatous disease in the ascending aorta. So here's a relatively normal example again. And sometimes you may actually be able to still see the aortic valve in the image, but that's not a requirement. As you pull up the probe a bit further, you're going to go through the blind spot as you pass behind the left main stem bronchus, and going past the blind spot, you will then come upon the arch. And at zero degrees, you will have the aortic arch long axis view. And where you can see uh, the aortic arch flow, any potential dissection or dilation of the aortic arch. And this is a fairly normal example of that with color flow drop on the right. Again, you can see that the blood is flowing from the left to the right of the image. Now the aortic arch short axis view, uh, which also, also corresponds to the pulmonary artery long axis view, uh, is an underappreciated uh, view, but potentially quite informative. Uh, it gives you a great view of the pulmonary outflow tract and the ascending PA, and is uh, one of the best views for making a Doppler measurement of the pulmonary valve and the PA velocities. Also, by rotating the probe left and right from this position, you're potentially able to get some images of the aortic arch vessels, depending on where your trachea is located and how large your blind spot is. And in particular, you may be able to image the distal arch. So this area over here, if you rotate the plane over, and this is where the ligamentum arteriosum would be located or where a patent ductus arteriosus would be if the patient has a shunt. Uh, this location is also the second most common location for the initiation of a dissection tear because it has some contour irregularity related to the ductus arteriosus and is also uh, the most common location for coarctation of the aorta. This is again a relatively normal version of that view with the color dropper on the right and the 2D on the left. And from the same view, by rotating uh, left, you can begin to image uh, a variable number of the arch vessels. In some cases, all three of them. It's quite difficult to distinguish uh, which one you're looking at unless you count them as you go back and forth. The left subclavian artery is imaged in the vast majority of patients. And it's we then have the images of the descending aorta, uh, which can actually be performed anywhere from the lower esophagus all the way to the upper esophagus, and allows us to image nearly the full length of the, ascending aorta, of the descending aorta. And is often where type B dissections, significant atherosclerosis, and aneurysms are diagnosed. We get the corresponding long axis view with the blood flowing from right to left.
here we have the long axis view and a short axis view cut slightly above the valve itself. You can see the valve itself is quite calcified. You have the dissection flaps coming almost uh, to the actual valve leaflets. The true lumen is actually a very small space between these two flaps. And then you have essentially a circumferential false lumen that goes all the way around. And this is a dissection flap in the descending aorta. So erg dissections uh, are commonly classified according to the Stanford classification, whose primary purpose is to identify which cases require emergency surgery and which ones can be managed more conservatively and potentially undergo either medical management or elective surgery. About 60% of cases that present are type A dissections, which is ones that involve the ascending aorta or the arch, and the remaining 30 to 40% are type B, which are ones where the pathology is all distal to the left subclavian artery and as such does not pose nearly as high a risk of stroke or cardiac involvement. Diagnosis of a type A dissection can obviously be life-saving, and prompt repair of these is a very important as mortality increases rapidly with any delay. As a surgical diagram of the aortic root, so that's the aortic valve there, and that is the hematoma in the false lumen. There are numerous significant complications of type A dissections, including acute aortic insufficiency, which can cause complete hemodynamic decompensation, coronary artery dissection and avulsion, more commonly in the right than the left, which can obviously cause infarcts and ischemia, pericardial tamponade in the event of any leakage, aortic rupture, which is typically fatal, extension of the dissection into arch vessels, which can result in stroke, and avulsion of any branches in the, in the descending aorta, which can also cause various forms of ischemia from spinal cord ischemia to visceral ischemia. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, these are some uh, key references, including some guidelines and reviews. Uh, at the top is a link to this presentation and also uh, links to two presentations by the University of Utah group. These are freely available online and they're both excellent lectures that cover more ground than I was able to cover in the 15 minutes today. And a big thank you to my lab team and my mentors. And thank you again for your attention.